All right, so it's almost 510, so we'll just go ahead and get started. Hey everyone, welcome to the Thursday problem set review. So today we'll be covering problems one through four in order. Um, and if at any time while we're presenting you have questions about the problem, feel free to just type the questions into the main chat. And if the tutor doesn't um, see the question while they're uh, going over the problem, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask the question. Of course, we'll be pausing to see if anyone has questions at any point. And if you have questions about other problems uh, after the tutor is done presenting, you can feel free to message them or you can message the main chat and we can work through the problems together. And if you have any questions about the Jupyter Notebook problems, feel free to either message me or Fayaz and we'll be able to help you out with those. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started with number one. Yeah. All right. So I'll be doing question one. And just to make sure, can everyone see my screen? Yeah, it's good. It's good. All right. So let's just get into it. So if we're looking at question one, and I'll label this question one, part A, and then part one, it's asking us to derive an equation for the ratio of multiplicities in terms of the ratio of volumes. And so what's important here to know is going to be this relationship, which is based on Sterling's approximation. So I'll write this out real quick. Give me one second. So if this is ln, if this is dub, the multiplicity of state one, some state one, n ln m1 n. So I think you've seen that in class. And there's actually this relationship as well, where m is equal to alpha times volume. If m is the number of grid boxes, we can view that as a uh, sort of volume multiplied by, as volume multiplied by some factor alpha. So this then becomes uh, n times ln of alpha v1 divided by n. So we can use this relationship to write out the ratio multiplicities. So we want to take the natural log of the ratio multiplicities if we're going to do this because this has a natural log here, which if you're using your log rules, this can be written out as ln of multiplicity B minus ln multiplicity of A. And then we can substitute in this relationship into here. So we get N ln alpha multiplicity B divided by N minus N ln alpha multiplicity A divided by N. And then you can simplify this down using your log rules and some other algebra. And you can get an ans uh, answer in terms of natural log something. And for your final answer, you can simplify this down by taking e to the power of whatever you get here to get an answer in terms of multiplicity. And that answer, just to give you a hint, will be an exponential. So e to some power. And if you wanna, just so you know, if you wanna look at, um, I'll write this over here. If you wanna look at this relationship and this proof, you can go to page 324 in your textbook and it's in box 7.3. Um, okay. Oh, looks, looks good. All right, then. I'll move on to part two. And in part two, it's asking you which of the following equations correctly describes the ratio of the probabilities of finding state B, probability B versus state A, probability of A, written as probability B over probability of A. So this is going to be using the answer that you derived in the previous problem. And I'll tell you that you can think of this ratio of probabilities as equal to the ratio of the multiplicities. So using this relationship then, you can then use your answer from part one and then solve for the answer to this. And that's pretty straightforward. Just look back at the beginning of the problem, look at how many molecules they give you and what other variables. You're gonna have to write out uh, the ratio of volume B to volume A. 
Uh, so look at what's given for volume B and volume A, and you can solve for the relationship there, plug that in, and you should be able to get your answer. Uh, for part one, um, yeah. should it be N, L, N, alpha, VB instead of WB? Yes, sorry, I wrote W by accident. This should be, ooh, how do I fix this? Yes, it should be a V. My bad, thank you for catching that. It should be Vs, yes. Also, oh, right. here, um, yeah. how, how do the ends cancel out to the final, like, you know, after that same line where you corrected the volumes, yeah. um, it comes up just to natural log of something. Um, mm -hmm. Do the ends then at the beginning cancel out? Well, you mean these ends? Yeah. Is that what you're about? Well, you can pull these out, right? And then they won't cancel out, but you can pull them out to get a neater equation. And then when you simplify, you'll have that N out in front of that whole uh, proportion. Okay, thank you. So our final part of that should be like N times natural yeah, it's gonna be, something and then... Exactly, yeah. Okay, got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, in that case, I'm going to move on to part one, part B. Uh, all right, you can all see that. And then I think it's labeled part one again, correct? Yes. All right, so this is a different situation where we have state A, state B again, except in state A, you have a, a box where you have one mole of A molecules on the left side, one mole of B molecules on the right side split up. And then was it transitions to state B, you remove that barrier that's separating them and they all mix together. So first question, starting from, uh, starting the equation for the change in entropy for the expansion of an ideal gas, show that the change in entropy going from state A to state B is given by that relationship, delta S is equal to negative N, KB, and all that fun stuff, which we will, I'll walk you through right now. So one thing we need to start with first is what is our equation, starting equation that we should use. So I'm gonna write this out first for the change in entropy for state A. I'm gonna start there, which is gonna be equal to Na, Kb, Ln, B2, divided by B1. So we have that relationship, and we can write out the same thing for state B, which is just we're just using the uh, quantities for state B. And we have this relationship V2 divided by V1, which depending on if we're gonna be looking at state A or state B will be the total sum of the molecules, which is molecules in state, uh, sorry, uh, molecules of A plus molecules of B divided by molecules of whatever we're looking at. Uh, I'll say this is for uh, a molecules, so it'll be divided by Na. It'll be the same thing except we're dividing Nb if we're looking at Nb molecules. So instead of what's written up there, we can also treat this as the total entropy is equal to the changes of entropy of Sa and change in entropy of B, which we can then plug these values into, which is Na, Kb, Ln of plugging in for volume, Na and B, divided by Na because we're looking at entropy for A, plus same thing except with B. So we see the answer that they want us to derive is negative. So what we can do is pull out a negative sign from each of these. And I'm gonna factor out the KB in the same thing. And now what this gives us is, because we pulled out a negative sign, to make this equal, we, we add a negative sign for this uh, natural log, which then flips this, right? So we're just taking the inverse. So now we're here. 
So now we know looking at this answer that it says that we just have negative n kb out front, meaning we have out front negative, I'll write kb here, and then n, which is equal to na plus n, I think that's supposed to be nb. It doesn't really matter in this case because uh, and, uh, molecules of A is the same amount of molecules of B. So we know this is that N term that's out front, but we don't have anything that we could factor out as of right now in this uh, quantity. So if we want to pull this quantity out of this, uh, I'll box it here, out of this uh, quantity I boxed, we're going to need to divide by this Na plus Nb. So I'll write that out, Na plus Na plus Nb times Ln Na plus Nb plus uh, Nb divided by Na plus Nb. Ln of that. So now we have this set up and we can just simplify this based on the other equations given, which is negative N Kb uh, times, this is X of A, Ln, X of A plus X of B, which is mole fraction, or fraction, uh, times next. Can you move your, um, paper out? Oh, sorry, did it get moved? My bad. Let me, uh, oh, that's not good. Sorry about that. <laughs> I got a weird setup. Is that better? Yeah. There we go. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so yes, yeah, so this is just simplifying it from this line down in terms of the variables given. I'm going to leave that for a, just a couple seconds so everyone can look because we're actually going to be using that equation in the next problem. Okay. Oh, I got like three minutes. Okay. That's fine. All right, I'm going to move on. If you, after I'm done talking, you can message me privately and we can discuss that more if you have any more questions. But I'm going to move on to the last two parts of this. Let me just center this. There we go. So this is part two now, which is asking us what's the change in free energy going from state A to state B at 300 Kelvin. So, and it gives us the energy of A molecules and not depend on position and energy of B molecules is higher by two kilojoules per mole in the left half of the box. So if we have this box here, in the left half we have the B molecules are going to be two kilojoules higher than on this right side. And I'll just call that zero for now. So we're going to be using the Helmholtz free energy to solve for this change in energy, which is delta A plus uh, delta sorry, U. This? It's, this is uh, part two of part B, question one. Oh, okay, thank you. Yes, sorry, uh, so let me put a B there. Um, times T delta S. So we can first solve for delta U, which is the energy in state B, energy in state A. So in state, it says that molecules of B, uh, for B are two kilojoules higher in the left half of the box. In state A, there are no molecules of B, right? So that means U of A is equal to zero. And then in U of B, because this is spread out evenly in this box, in the left half of that box, when there's one mole of molecules in the right side of the box, now that it's able to spread out through the whole box. In just the left half of that box, you're going to have 0.5 moles of B molecules. And then they're going to be two kilojoules higher. So multiply by two kilojoules per mole. And you'll get one kilojoule in that left half of the box. And we're going to want this in kilojoules per mole. So it's one kilojoule divided by uh, two, uh, two moles total because two moles of total molecules, and that's going to give you 0.5 kilojoules per mole. And that's going to be your delta U, which is just your UB in this case, since UA is zero. Now we need to solve for your entropy, 
which is just the equation we wrote previously. And I'll just write that out real quick, negative one, KB, XA, LN, XA, plus XB, LN, XB. So we know that we can, we're given that there's two moles of total molecules. So using Avogadro's number, we can take our two moles, multiply by Avogadro's number to get the total number of molecules. You know what KB is, that's a constant. And then the mole fraction, which is actually gonna be the same for XA and XB because there's the same amount of each molecule. That's gonna be, you can just treat this as one mole of either of those divided by one mole of A plus one mole of B, which is just gonna be 0.5. So using that, you can plug into there, solve for your delta S, and then use this Hemsholt Hemholtz equation, solve for your change in free energy. And looks like I'm just out of time. So for part three, I'll just say, or sorry, that's part A and then part B, I'm labeling this really wrong. For part B, you're just gonna use your Boltzmann, which you can use with your free energy, which is probability B, probability A is equal to E negative delta A, which you solved for in the previous problem, divided by RT, or whatever your answer, whatever units your answer is in, and that'll be your answer for part B. Uh, sorry to rush to that last part. Uh, that was really fast. Message me privately if you wanna talk about that or you're confused about anything. But for now, I think we can move on to the next problem. Okay, so I'll be talking about question two. Okay, so for part one, for number two, so now we are asked about the changing entropy of the two states. And here we have 100 residuals, and we also have two possible states, one is unfolded and one is folded. So for the unfolded state, we have, um, for each residual, there are three possible conformations. And for the folded state, for each residual, there's one possible conformation. So, and here's the equation for multiplicity. So here, W1, W2, and W3, each is the multiplicity for one residual. And since we know that the multiplicity, the number of possible conformation for the unfolded state is three, so we can calculate the entropy for the unfolded state using three times three times, like all the way to 100 times, which will give us three to the 100th power. So that will give us the multiplicity of the unfolded states, which is, you can also just plug into the equation right here. And then for the folded states, since the, there's only one possible confirmation, so the multiplicity should just be one. And using this equation right here, we can just use one times one times like all the way to 100 times. So that would be one to the 100th power, so that will still give us one. And now we have the multiplicity for the two states. We can um, plug them into the entropy equation, which is the one right here. And we're given in the problem that um, delta S equals to S folded minus S unfolded. So it would just be KB net log of multiplicity of uh, folded state minus KB net log multiplicity of the unfolded state. And then we can just plug in to the numbers right here. Okay. 
which is 1 over 3 to the 100th power. And, and also in the question, we're asked to express the answer in multiples of um, r. So we need to use um, this conversion right here. So here, I believe you can just assume um, we have one mole of protein. One mole. So then this will just equal to R times natural log of one over three to the hundred power. Um, is there any questions? So I'll move on to number two, part two. So here we are asked to find the relative uh, probability of finding any molecules in the folded conformation um, versus the, uh, a single specific unfolded co conformation. So when we are asked about the probability, we need to think about the Boltzmann distribution, which is the relationship right here. So the probability of being in um, state I is directly proportional to um, the um, e to the negative energy of um, that state divided by RT. So, so then if we just take the ratio of the two, So now we need to figure out the value of delta u. So here I've listed out um, a few conditions that we already know. So first one is R when um, at 300 Kelvin, RT is equal to um, 2.5 kilojoules per mole. So we know that uh, it's 2.5 over, and then the second, um, conditions that we have 100 re residuals in the protein. And also for um, each residual, we have um, one hydrogen bonding. So we have 100 residual in the protein. And then for each residual, we have one hydrogen bond. And then for each hydrogen bond, we also have one kilojoules per mole of sta um, stabil stabilization energy. So that would give us minus 100 kilojoules per mole. And we know that the um, delta U here is negative because um, we're forming hydrogen bond. So, we're re um, so it's an exothermic reaction. So we're releasing energy to make the protein to become more stable. So the delta U here should be um, negative 100 kilojoules per mole. And so we can just plug that into here. And don't, don't forget there's a man, minus sign in, in the front as well. So that will give us 100 over 2.5. So you can do the calculation from here, but this number here should be greater than zero, right? So the entire thing should be greater than zero. So that implies the probability of folded state should be greater than probability of single um, confirmation, like a single co specific unfolded confirmation. Which implies that this state should be more favored. Is there any question? Uh, can you go over how you got the delta U value again? Sorry. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, so we know that there's 100 residuals in the protein. And then we know that for each residual, there's one hydrogen bond. And then for each hydrogen bond, we have um, one kilojoules per mole of stabilization energy. 
So we just uh, multiply those together. So it's 100 residual times um, one hydrogen bonds per residual. So that means 100 uh, hydrogen bonds. And then each bond will give us one um, kilojoules per mole of stabilization energy. So that means um, 100 kilojoules per mole of stabilization energy in total. Great, thank you so much. Okay, cool. So then we move on to number three. So here we are asking to find, um, we are asked to find the probability of the folded conformation versus any unfolded conformation. So now we need to take consideration of the multiplicity um, of, the, of the unfolded states. So I think it's, um, um, you guys went over in lecture, the Gibbs free energy equation. So here, delta H will just be the change in energy going from the folded state to um, the unfolded state. And then delta S here will take into consideration of the multiplicity or changing entropy. So we know that um, all the, um, all the um, possible unfolded conformation will have the same um, energy change for hydrogen bond um, formation. So delta H will still be the same as the one from part B which is still minus 100 kilojoules per mole. And then, and then delta S we calculated from part A, which is, um, which is 100, 100. And then we know here that um, RT at 300K is just 2.5 kilojoules per mole. So it will just be times 2.5. And then you can do the calculation from here to find the delta G. And the delta G here is just uh, is equal to the changing energy going from um, the folded state um, to the unfolded state which is the delta U right in this equation. And we derived this equation from part um, B already. So we can just plug in the numbers. So if you take a look at the delta G equation right here, so this number is um, apparently greater than um, negative 100 over here. So delta G here will be greater than um, zero. And then, which means this number here is greater than zero. And since we have a minus size in the front, so that means the x, the coefficient here will be um, smaller than zero. So this implies that the probability of the folded state is smaller than the probability of any unfolded state, unfolded conformation, which means this state now is more favorable. Is there any questions about this part? Okay, so I'll move on to number four. 
so from part one to um, three, we have considered um, two things. The first one is the changing the changing energy um, of hydrogen bonding from the folded state to um, unfolded state, which is uh, negative one kilojoules per mole. And we also consider in part A the changing entropy um, of the protein itself going from the folded state to unfolded state. And what we have not considered is the um, interaction between the, the protein and the water. So if you look at the two pictures right here, um, in the folded state, the, um, so these ones are the water molecules. And then this, um, this thing here is the uh, unfolded protein. So we can see that water molecules can um, have a lot more interactions between uh, with the protein in the folded state. Whereas in the, oh, sorry, in the unfolded state, whereas in the folded state, here's the protein and here's the water molecules. So since um, it forms a core in the middle, so water molecules can only interact with the protein um, from the side. So it gives them less interaction. So what we have not considered in the problem is the interaction between the protein chain and the water molecules. And also another thing that we have not considered is the changing entropy of water molecules. So in problem A, we consider the changing entropy for um, these two proteins. But um, another entropy that we need to consider is the entropy change of these water molecules. And we can see that um, in the folded state, the since the water molecules interact a lot less, with the protein chains, so they can um, move around a lot more freely. So that means in the folded state, the changing entropy of water molecules actually increase. Water molecules. And just to be more accurate, the entropy of water increase when pro protein folds. Is there any questions about this part? If not, we can move on to number three. Okay, so, all right, so hopefully all of you can see this. So number three, we're kind of asked to blend together a few concepts. So one is the idea of the random walk and the other is the idea of the ideal polymer chain. And this is all blended together to uh, construct the different microstates that are possible for a protein. So to give you a more concrete example of this, the way that uh, the random walk is applied to um, the protein is suppose you have some residue, call it residue one. and, and in order to create the entire uh, protein, the second residue can be, so this is a circle of radius length L. So the second residue can be along any one of these segments. So let's say for sake of argument, this is gonna be residue two. And then residue two also has another radius of length L around it. And the third residue can be in any position inside the circle. And let's say it's over here. So by randomly picking a point inside the circle of radius L, we can construct a different conformation for the protein. And this is one such possible microstate. Uh, another possible microstate would be something like this. Um, these are just very rough drawings. But the main takeaway here is that since both of these conformations are equal in energy, both of these two microstates are equally likely. But in this case, we, since we were looking at a residue and an entire circle, we were allowed to take movements in two directions, right? Either in the x direction or the y direction. 
but here we make one more simplification before moving on to part one, which is that we're only looking at changes in the x direction, so either left or right, which means that if you have a given residue uh, at any given turn, you can either move to the left or you can move to the right. And both of these displacements are essentially equal. And also the problem gives us a note that we're allowed to think of this in terms of flipping a coin and resulting in either heads or tails. Um, so, you know, you can say that heads is essentially equivalent to moving to the left and tails is kind of like moving to the right. So now we're asked to consider, let's say we have 11 residues and with each step, we can uh, make a step size of length L either to the left or to the right. And we're asked to find the multiplicity of a protein in which the end distance is about 2L. So if you remember the previous part, um, first of all, we can write down a few facts that we remember. So NR plus NL, so where NR is a number of steps to the right and L and NL is a number of steps to the left, we know that this is going to be equal to 10 because we're given that the random walk is of length 10 steps, which means this is kind of like flipping a coin 10 times. Also, we know that the distance between the ends is 2L meaning that if we have this quantity uh, delta, which is the difference between like the end displacement, um, this means that we have equal to two. So essentially you have, you have either two more steps to the right or two more steps to the left, which is kind of like flip, when you're flipping 10 coins, you have either six heads and four tails or you have four tails and six heads. So based on this, you're essentially asked to calculate the multiplicity. And since I kind of, strongly hinted at it already, um, you, you have two equations here, two variables, so you can kind of solve for this in terms of um, like a coin flipping problem in terms of binomial probability. So recalling that binomial probability is this, where M and N in this case would be your NR and NL, and you essentially need to solve for the values that will satisfy these two equations, but I think you can kind of uh, glean that from inspection. Um, any questions on part one? Okay, so then I'll move on to part two. So what is the distance between the ends of the chain that corresponds to the maximum entropy and what is the associated multiplicity? So here we know that entropy is given by KBLNW. So if we want to maximize, so if we want to maximize entropy, we should maximize multiplicity. Also, we know that since we're already thinking of this problem in terms of coin flipping, in terms of steps to the right being considered tails or steps to the uh, left being considered heads, we can recall the graph that we've seen uh, on binomial probability that looks somewhat like this, where on, this, on one extrema you have zero and on the other extrema you have n, where n is the number of uh, steps that you take. So you can consider this as being a number of steps to the left. Um, but this could also be a number of steps to the right. It doesn't exactly matter because like fl flipping a coin, uh, this variable here could be number of heads that you have or number of tails that you have. And this is probability. So looking at this graph, I think you can kind of intuitively have a feel for what value corresponds to maximum entropy. And the hint that I would leave you with is if you're given the problem of flipping 10 coins, what type of outcome would be most likely? An outcome in which you get 10 heads and zero tails or something uh, more in the middle. And that's kind of why the binomial probability distribution looks sort of like this. And then once you determine what two values there are for steps to the right and steps to the left, you should be able to solve this and calculate the multiplicity. Uh, kind of rushed through that a little bit. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, if not, we'll move on to the rest of problem three. Hey, uh, hopefully you guys can see my screen and hear me. Um, I'll be doing the second part of part three. Sorry, my hand's going to be in the way, but I'll move it when I'm done writing. Um, I'll write a little bit bigger too. Okay, so for part three, um, three, uh, part three, part A of part three, um, where we basically have the protein starting out in this configuration where it's folded up uh here let me just draw this out real quick and then there's a distance of 100 angstroms i believe is the number yeah 100 angstroms like so and we then switch to a situ situation where it's like spread out into basically a straight line with distance a thousand angstroms and so we're trying to basically assess in which case is the 
entropy is what's happening to delta s in this situation. Um, so basically the thought process you want to have when going through a question like this is you want to see how many different configurations there are for this kind of state where it's, there's the end-to-end -end distance is 100 angstroms. As Pujan mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different ways you can have it. Like this one was the first one, but you could also have it going out in like an, a different orientation and still have the same end-to-end -end distance. So that's basically the way you want to think about it is that there's many more types of possibilities that you could have um, that, that protein be at this end-to-end -end distance, which means that your W is much bigger than in this situation where the W is much smaller. So um, as you guys know, S is equal to uh, KB ln W. And so when you do the, um, the math between it, you'll see that the, as since the entropy is going down, I mean, since the multiplicity is going down, you'd expect the entropy to decrease when you go from this state to this state. Any questions on that? Or I'll move on to the second part. OK. If not, I'll move on to part B. Um, in this part, we're showing that the magnitude of delta S is equal to 312 um, times R joules per mole per Kelvin. And the question didn't really state it in here, but I would you want to assume that you're you're dealing with one mole for this question in order for the unit conversions to work out at the end. Um, so yeah, you have from the earlier part of the question, you have that P of L is equal to two pi N. Um, we don't need to write out the entire expression. We just need to write out that e to the negative L squared over two and L squared. And we know that um, the W of the system is proportional to the probability. Um, so that means that we can write, we, we can ignore this. Uh, um, this sorry, I can't. I can't really read whatever's in the parentheses right there. Does that say two pi or? Yeah, it says two pi. It's the same thing as the question. Uh, it doesn't oh. actually really matter for the, this part. Oh, OK, cool. We're only looking at um, d um, w for right now, the multiplicity. All right, uh, cool. So we know that, yeah, we know that the multiplicity is proportional to the probability. And we know that the probability varies like this, which is the important part, e to the negative l squared. So we can basically write that. Um, the w, w, the multiplicity of the system, is equal to alpha, which is just a proportionality constant. And then look at the important part, which is how this changes with the rest of the expression. And so that's, again, e to the negative l squared over 2n l squared, lowercase l squared. And so then we can again use that S is equal to the KB times, uh, sorry, S is equal to KB log of omega. And from there we can Wait, calculate. Sorry, could you repeat what the W um, equals the alpha E negative L squared over, what's the last part, the denominator? Uh, it's 2N L squared. Okay, thank it's you. The, it's the same thing as the probability again. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and so what this allows us to basically do is calculate a delta S. Um, the way that I think makes a little bit more intuitive sense is just we can simplify this expression first and then use, then calculate delta S from there. Uh, so what, what we can do is simplify, just plug W into here and we find that S is equal to KB natural log of alpha plus KB of natural log of uh, e to the negative L squared over 2N, sorry, 2N L squared. And when you simplify this down even further, this becomes S is equal to KB log alpha plus KB times negative L squared over 2N L squared. And so when you do delta S um, from an L, L, L2 minus L1 situation, you find that delta S is equal to S2 minus S1 is equal to, you find that this term here, it cancels out. And so you just get KB of, let me just 
Let me make sure I get my signs right. L2 squared and L1 squared. And so from here, you should be able to just plug and chug with the rest of the, the, the um, numbers that are given to you in the problem. And you'll find that it should equal negative 312 KB. And since we know that we're, we're assuming that we have one mole in this case, um, that's how we can basically get into the terms of, since we have, K, KB is in terms of joules per Kelvin, right? And we know that we have, um, uh, this is, I guess, per one mole. Then by converting, converting that by the conversion rate of 6. Point, Six point oh two two times ten to the twenty three for one mole. Uh, then you should end up with negative three twelve times R. Sorry, joules per mole Kelvin. Yeah. Sorry, the last part is just unit conversions. Um, you can figure it out. Just make sure that all your units cancel out um, when you get to your final answer. I kind of glossed over that quickly, but in order for the problem to work out, you need to make sure that you assume that you have one mole as well. Uh, any questions on that last part? It's um, a lot of just um, natural log properties in order to simplify the equation down to that, that form. So yeah, it's negative 312? Yeah, negative 312 times R, okay, which is you. what you're supposed to get based on what the problem says. So, yeah. yep. Yeah, because yeah, it's asking for the magnitude of the change in entropy. All right. Sorry if I went a little bit over, but I think we should probably move on to question four now. James, are you there? Okay. Uh, can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So now we are on question four. So the question four first says, so that we are trying to calculate the change in free energy that is a minimum amount of work that is required to carry out the process. And we are also told that under this condition, the protein chain behaves like ideal polymer. And the reason why we have a change in free energy is because of the contribution of Change in, change in entropy. And because we know that we are trying to calculate the free energy contributed by the change in entropy, we're gonna use um, Helmholtz um, free energy formula. So we are given that delta A is defined to be delta U minus T delta S provided in the lecture slide. And based on the information in this question, we said, it says that the protein chain behaves like the ideal polymer, which means in two cases, the polymers are not interacting with each other. So this is not the case. Neither, they're not rotating in a way that it can invest potential energy. So the overall that we know that um, delta U has to be zero. And then from the given, um, from the question three, we calculated delta S, which is some value roughly like negative 300 kilojoules per mole. Uh, more specifically, he said negative 312. And then we're just going to plug it in. So minus 300 Kelvin. So you should get some numbers here. And then the second part. So they're asking, how many ATP molecules do you need in the end? And basically, we, we know the total, total of energy we need to do the process is this amount given above. And we're going to divide it by 
how much the ATP per ATP uh, and how much energy the per ATP provides, and then which is 35 kilojoules per mole. And basically, you should be able to find how many molecules you're gonna need for this process. And the second part, in reality, we need one ATP molecules per reside, and basically your answer is either small or greater. And if you do your math and calculation, it should be smaller. And then the reason why this one is smaller is because you can go back to the current condition that you're given, that the protein chain in this question behaves as an ideal polymer. And in reality, the protein never really behaves like ideal polymer. And then from there, you can explain why we are expecting a greater value for in reality compared to the ideal value we calculated in this question. Any questions? Okay. Uh -huh.